going to attempt to share some things regarding the Moadim, the appointed times of the Lord. Appointments are very important. Um, there is a place in Daniel where Daniel saw in prophecy that in the end times that the enemy would switch the times and the seasons of God, the appointments of God, so that his people would not know his appointments. I like to say it this way. It's as if you have a bunch of farmers who do not know that there are appointed times to, to, to till the ground, to, to put manure on the ground, to put seed on the ground, to water it. And so that if they're aimlessly placing seed on the ground because that's what they do, if you put seed in the ground in the middle of winter, I don't care how hard you work or how much faith you have, nothing will grow as a result of it. Right. Because God knows there's a set appointed time for everything. Amen. And you know, in our lives, when you have an appointment with a doctor, something as simple as that, and the doctor says, you know, on Monday at 3 o'clock, it's the appointment, I'm going to see you. You can show up on Tuesday, you can show up on Saturday, you can show up on Sunday, you can show up every single day of the week, but he's only going to meet you on the day he said, this is the appointment that I made to meet with you. The Moadim, or the appointed times of the Lord, I'm going to share with you, are times that, that God said to the children of Israel, until heaven and earth pass away, these are my appointed times, and I will meet you at those times. The enemy knows these are so important, so he's kind of like shifted our thoughts so that we, we're basically on earth, waiting for Jesus to come. And we're just hanging in there, doing the best we can missing out on the blessings of God from appointment to appointment to appointment. And Adonai wants to restore that to us. And Yeshua said, until heaven and earth pass away, not the slightest stroke of the pen, not one jot, not one tittle, will pass from, from, from the Torah, from the law. And I want to show you a, a, a visual to help you understand how important this is. Um, because it, we have gone so far away f from, from the, the exactness of the Word of God uh, that um, it's my mind that only God can do a miracle to return us back to the essence of His Word. Okay, And um, uh, you may be familiar, uh, remember Yeshua was speaking to a rabbi and, uh, and the rabbi asked him, you know, what is the most important commandment, you know, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, <coughs> soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself, okay? So Yeshua was a, a Jewish rabbi, so there's a lot of things that Jewish rabbis and Jewish people kind of know, it's kind of like, a, a, you know, it's kind of like meatballs to, I don't know, uh, what is the Italian people? <laughs> yeah, and you're, like, you know meatballs, you know, and, and, you're, and your Irish family doesn't know meat the balls the way you know meat the balls if you're Italian, you know what I'm saying? And so, and so there is lingo and, and talk that people speak. And so, um, and so one of the most sacred prayers is, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your hearts, one shall, okay, that whole thing, most sacred prayer in, in Hebrew understanding. Okay. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohinu, Adonai Chad. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay. And I'm just going to show you one word in the Shema. Okay. And this is Echad. It begins this way, Echad. Okay. I better draw that. No, you don't have to draw it at all. You don't even have to memorize this because I'm going to show you Another word that looks identically the same. Do you notice how identical these two words look? Almost exactly the same. One of these is slightly different than the other. Can you see it? It's this letter right here, or this symbol. The one below has a little bit of a squiggle. The one on top has no squiggle at all. It just goes straight down. This is what Yeshua meant when he said, not the slightest change of a stroke of a pen can be moved from the Word of God, from the Torah. Okay? 
by the way, and, I, and, and by the way, forgive me, you know, because I, I, when I go and minister unto the Lord, I have no idea that there are actually ministries going on. <laughs> so, so sometimes I might say something, maybe a pastor has been saying something, I don't know, I'm not here for pastors, I'm not here for anybody, I'm here to minister unto the Lord. So you have to kind of excuse, excuse me. Because some places I go, people say, no, we only read the King James, and other people say, no, it's only this and that. And I want to say something, okay? If you're not reading this, Whatever you're reading is by God's grace, and you better rely on the Holy Spirit, because He's the one who gives us the Word in spirit. Okay? Really important. So I, I don't advocate for any one translation of Scripture except for the Holy Spirit that has been placed in our hearts. Okay? That's because I'm dyslexic, so I really, it doesn't matter what the Scripture I read, it's all messed up. It's all messed up. Oh, glory to God. All right. So here we go. Slight variation. This word is echad. That last symbol is a, a D sound. Echad. Echad. This one, that's an erase. Echar. Echad. Echar. Echad. Echar. D sound. R sound. That little tiny variation makes this word say another. Echar means another. Echad means one. A slight variation on the pen would change that scripture to read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is another. And the Lord is not another. He is the one God. So I share this to just show you how far we have gone away from not the slightest stroke of a pen can be moved from God's laws. Because the slightest stroke of a pen will change the meaning of His word. Something so simple. Truly, truly, we have to understand the things of God through spirit. Amen. Through spirit. And I am so thankful that that's exactly the covenant that he's made with us. So with that little example, I want to share something also to bring us back to the understanding of God's promises and then the fulfillment of his promises. Uh, a lot of us, when we hear about the new covenant, we think that the new covenant is a uh, New Testament thing. The new covenant was promised long before Messiah even came onto this earth. And basically the Spirit of the Lord said to his people, you know, the day shall come where I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. It won't be like the covenant I made with them when I brought them from Egypt and I took them by the hand. And they were unfaithful to me. It will be a new covenant. I am going to take my laws and I am going to write my laws in their heart and in their mind. You see, the new covenant is not a replacement or a different covenant from the laws of God. It's God saying, I'm going to take my laws and I'll inscribe them in your heart so you'll understand them in spirit. And not as one who needs the letter, because the letter kills. The spirit gives life. Give you an example of this. You know, when Yeshua was on earth, uh, they brought a, a prostitute, threw it at, her at his feet, and they said to him, The law says if a woman is caught in adultery, she must be stoned. And Yeshua says, Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely right. I can't change that. So what Yeshua did was very simple. Because he's not dealing with the letter of the law. He's dealing with the spirit of the law. He's going to use the same law that they're using to kill someone to turn around and save the same person without changing the law. And it is important that you understand this because as a rabbi, I need to show you that he didn't set her free because he had mercy on her and changed the law. He set her free because according to the law, she could not be condemned under these conditions. Very simple. When he said, those of you who are without sin, pick up a stone and cast the first stone. 
They were righteous people right there on that day. But the righteous people could understand in spirit. And they said, there's only one stone here. It's the king. We can't pick him up. That the righteous would not pick up a stone because the righteous are always looking for a way that God will bring salvation to the broken. The only people who picked up a stone are the people who are self-righteous. That's right. And so they picked up a stone because they want to use the letter of the law to kill. And Yeshua said, those without sin cast the first stone. The only people who picked up stones were the ones who had sin. One by one they left. It was those who had sin who had witnessed the woman. The same scripture that says you must take a prostitute and stoner also says you need two witnesses to be present to accuse her in order for the matter to be established. So at the end, after he's drawing tic-tac-toe on the ground, and everyone wants to know, what was he drawing? It doesn't matter. He was allowing time to go by until every single one of the legal witnesses who had seen this were gone. And suddenly he gets up and he looks at her and says, Woman, where are your accusers? According to the law, you need two witnesses in order for us to go ahead and stone you. He had no problem stoning her. He simply said, I'm going to use the law that you're using to kill, I'm going to use the law to save because I am Lord of the law. In spirit, I am Lord of the law and I am God's salvation. So I am the fulfillment of the law because I come to save, wow. not to kill. And the woman looked around and she said, they're gone. There were righteous people there that could have stoned her. But they were so excited about what God was doing, they didn't have time to pick up a stone. That's the thing about the people who are truly righteous. See, the truly righteous are not looking to judge people. The truly righteous are always waiting to see, how's God going to save this? How's God going to save this situation? How's God going to take care of this? The self-righteous are always ready to point the figure and to judge and, and, and to correct every single matter. The woman looked around and she says, they're gone. According to the law, it is unlawful to condemn anybody to death unless the witnesses who saw it are present. He used the very law they were using to kill her to set her free without changing the stroke of a pen. I have to express it this way because if not, then I'd just be here to give you instructions. And I'm not here to give you any instructions. I'm here to just awaken this thing within you that you may see that the God of the universe lives in me and wants to feed off of these Hebraic things because I'll tell you the truth. You <laughs> have been grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. And the sap that flows from the roots all the way from Abraham and up is supposed to flow through your veins. There is a Hebrew rabbi inside of you. <laughs> and it's exciting to see this thing come alive. Because you're the generation that's been chosen to see these beautiful things of God. He's going to do this thing. He doesn't need our help. He's going to do it because, because that's what he does. Because that's what he does. Um, okay, oh my God. I, I, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to try to speak about Passover today. Uh, so, okay, we're going to speak about six festivals. Uh, these are biblical festivals that were, uh, the children of Israel were instructed to keep forever. As long as we have Jews on earth, and as long as the heavens and earth are still there, we are to keep the festivals of the Lord. By the way, festivals are not kept as a matter of salvation. Let's just get the right away. Okay. Anyone here who has problems because of what that Rabbi Shaul, Paul, said, which says, don't let anybody criticize you for days and feasts and all that, it goes both ways, which means if you want to celebrate the festivals of the Lord, no one can criticize you for doing it. Just like someone who does it can't criticize you not to do it. Okay, so it goes both ways. The issue that he was dealing with is they were trying to tell the people, the Gentiles in particular, 
that if you don't keep these things, you're not saved. Salvation is not, nor has ever been, accomplished by keeping the law. It has always been accomplished because <laughs> lambs were brought, and they were slain, and blood was spilled, and it was the blood of lambs in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the only difference is in the New Testament is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We have never ever been able to come close to God because of our ability to keep God's instructions. God's instructions are simple. It's just for a good life. Okay? So anyone here struggling thinking that this rabbi is coming and telling us that we have to keep these things, you don't have to do jack. But say, praise God! Oh, I went to this yeshiva class. I still have no clue what's going on, but yeah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Praise God. All right. Passover. Uh, uh, um, Habikarim, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, comes right after Passover. Uh, seven weeks after Passover. Uh, the, um, uh, Shavuot, which is the, the festival of weeks in the church, is called Pentecost. Pentecost is not a Hebrew word. Pentecost actually it means 50 or weeks or something like that. Um, and uh, actually it's a translation of a Hebrew word which is Shavuot, which means weeks. Okay? Um, and that these, by the way, are the spring festivals. All these take place in the spring and a little into the summer. The month of Nisan, the first month of the biblical calendar, just, just began a few days ago. I will explain a little bit about that so that you kind of know where we are in God's calendar. And we're going to be celebrating these festivals. These are the first festivals. This is, uh, Passover is going to be celebrated in about uh, 12 days or so from now. Okay? You can look at the moon and know exactly the day that you're going to celebrate it. Matter of fact, mark this. This is kind of neat because God's calendar is up in the heavens all the time. The next time you see a full moon, a full moon, it's going to happen in about 12 days. On that day of the full moon, go on your computer and see what's today's date in the biblical calendar, and it'll pop up. Today's the 14th day of the first month. It's the month of Nisan, and it's the day that all the Jews all over the world are celebrating Passover. And the moon will mark it. Kind of neat. Mm. So these are the spring festivals. Okay? Once the spring festivals are done, these are the autumn festivals. The autumn festivals begin on the seventh month of the biblical calendar. You literally have to take your understanding of time and flush it down the toilet. Have you ever read an inscription that says, and on the first month the children of Israel went into, okay, what do you think that is, to January? March, eh? First month, according to God's calendar, the lunar calendar. And when God says, on the third day of the fourth month, it's all based on a lunar calendar. And I will show you how it works. I'll tell you, it's so simple. A child understands it. It's difficult for adults to grasp because our minds have become too seared with knowledge. But if you can get your mind back to that child place, you can understand God's calendar perfectly. Okay, so these are the spring festivals. The autumn festival, so these, this starts on the, on, the, on the first month, month number one, okay? And then the, these are the autumn festivals. And they begin on the seventh month of the biblical calendar. Okay, so because we just started this, this year in the biblical calendar, so it's like literally seven months from now will be these festivals over here. Okay. Um, the biblical appointed times, the Moedim, were used by the children of Israel for agriculture and also for all the spiritual things that had to do with, with, with us. They also have to do with life uh, uh, in, on earth since the very beginning, and it's actually a calendar that depicts the time that Messiah will return again. So anyway, why is this so important? Why is it so important to understand that the first festivals had to do with the first coming? And these three festivals have to do with the second coming. The reason why it's so important 
is because these were fulfilled exactly on their appointed day. And if God fulfilled these three festivals exactly on their appointed day, He's going to fulfill His second coming exactly on these appointed days. We don't know what year Gabriel is going to sound his big giant shofar. But one thing we know, if we are aware of the festivals every year and we celebrate the Feast of Trumpets, He will be sounding it on the day we're celebrating it. This year, or next year, or next year, doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter. And when you understand the timing of God, you'll realize, oh my God, we're actually doing it all at the same time. Okay? So, it'll take a little while for us to understand how time works, but I pray that even this evening, you'll have a little bit more of an understanding of how time works. Okay? This is the timeline we're used to. Okay? Ah... Uh, that's a cross, right? Usually there's an arc over here somewhere, all right? And then usually, this is the part I really don't like, there's this right here, and then there's a big arrow saying, you are right here. Well, I got a problem with that. <laughs> Because, you know, if we were here, <clears throat> we'd kind of know what's going on. But we happen to be smack dab in the middle of this unknown. And as a result of this, I mean, this is funny, but this is a reality in the body of Messiah. In the body of Messiah, basically everyone says, well, Yeshua's coming. They've been saying Yeshua's coming. People thought it was 2000, and that Y2K never happened, so now, it, now they're thinking it's something else. It's always something else. I remember listening to Prince, and now we're going to party like it's 1999. And I thought to myself, wow, 1999. Wow, what will that be like? Now when I say that, I'm embarrassed because people are saying, 1999? It's like the 1900s, man. Like, how old are you? <laughs> so, uh, so it's a real tough situation. So anyway, we're smack dab in the middle of this time right there, which is the unknown. This is really detrimental, and I'll tell you why. If you take someone and you sentence them to prison, let's say you're going to have them in there for one week, but you don't tell them it's one week. You just put them in prison. Okay? They don't know how long they're going to be here. If they're waiting day after day after day without the unknown, they might hang themselves because they, it's an unknown. They're in there, and every day is an eternity for them. They don't know if they're there forever. They don't know if they're there just for a short period. They don't know. So when you don't know, you feel discouraged. You take another man, and you say, you're going to be in prison for 10 years, and the man who's going to be there for 10 years knows. He can begin to mark on the wall. He says, you know it's going to be a long time, but, it's, but at, at the end of 10 years, I'm out of here. Even though he has a much longer sentence, he can endure a longer sentence because he knows what's coming. The man who's in there for a week and he does not know that whole week of time is an eternity for him and it's very discouraging. The body of Messiah is stuck on an unknown right now and it is, they're so discouraged. So discouraged. All you gotta do is run into a believer who, who used to be on fire for God like 20 years ago. And, and, and then you go to them and say, man, Jesus is coming soon. And they're like, yeah, 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 I, I, whatever. I, you know, he was coming soon 20 years ago too, you know. And, and, and that unknown leaves people. It, it, it opens the door for the enemy to mess with people's faith in their mind. So my prayer tonight is that you will shift from this unknown into a solid understanding of how God's calendar works. Because when you understand his calendar, you realize this is not how his calendar works. You'll throw away all the charts you have. And you begin to rejoice and say, oh my God, that's it? That simple? That simple. This is not God's calendar because God is not a linear God. Everything God does is found right down to the smallest thing that he has created. Right down to the atom, the nucleus of the atom, to the, to the galaxies and to the heavens. 
everything in the universe operates exactly the same way, circles, 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 everything, everything. If you had a square here and you brought it down to the smallest thing, you'd realize the square is made up of circles. God's time is not linear. God's time is a circle. This is why it's beautiful. You can never miss anything. Because if you don't catch it here, just stick around. Next year, at this time, it's coming again. And it's eternal, forward, and backwards at the same time. You'll catch it. If, if you exist at some point, you will catch the flow of God. You don't get left somewhere, you'll catch up to it. Or it will catch up to you. You see, this is not an unknown with a question mark. On this time of circles, we can now begin to place the festivals of the Lord. Okay? So, we're going to go ahead and do that on this little chart. And let's say that this is the first month, okay, of God's calendar, as it makes a big circle, okay, on Nisan, first month. Um, I'm going to put a little cross because I think we know that there's Passover that Messiah was crucified, okay? We, we know that, right? So, there it is in his calendar, okay? Um, this is seven days after Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, I'll put two little squares here. Oh, this is two pieces of matzah. Okay. One, two. Okay. Seven weeks after this, probably somewhere over here. Okay. We have the Feast of Weeks, which is known in the church as Pentecost. Okay. Um, coming down to about right here somewhere, half of the year, seventh month, make sense? Seventh month is a little past half of the year, okay? So if this is one, think of this as, as a clock. If this is one, two, three, four, five, six would be down here or something like that, seven, probably somewhere over here. Okay. Feast of Trumpets. Okay, coming around, uh, Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month. Ten days later is the Day of Atonement. Little tears over here. Okay, uh, 15 days after this, probably over here, we have the Feast of Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. You see it? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six festivals in God's time schedule. One, two, three, four, five, six. Pretty simple? Okay. So, when you're done fe celebrating the festivals of the Lord, as spring comes, you know, when, when, when life begins to come, and devour death because all winter everything is kind of dead, you know what I mean? And nothing can grow. Suddenly spring comes and devours death. There is the resurrection, that, you know, coming up. So, so God's count, it's like every year God says, okay, let's do this again. Let's do this again. And He brings us to another level of understanding. But it's not a linear time. It's like, okay, I've done this before. Now I'm doing it again, and I'm gaining more understanding of the things of God. Now I'm doing it again, I'm getting more understanding of the things of God. A constant circle, year after year after year. Okay? You with me so far? Okay. So if this is one year, okay, this would be the next year. Pretty simple, right? Because time in God's understanding is not a line, so it stays in a circle. 
Every year you just repeat it over and over and over again. You don't miss anything. Okay? And then this is another <coughs> year. <coughs> and another. And another. And another. And another. And another. And another. <coughs> and every single one of these years in this window of time, God's people are celebrating Passover. God is here today, yesterday, and forever celebrating at the same moment that the Messiah is being placed on the cross, at the same moment he's over here with the children of Israel in Egypt about getting them set to be free. And he's watching both events as if it's one event. So throughout our generations, whether you are the generation in Egypt or whether you are the generation 2,000 years ago watching the Messiah being put on a cross or whether you're the generation 2,000 years later now beginning to understand how God's come to work, it doesn't matter where you are in God's time. At that window of time, God comes and He meets with us and He opens up like a portal of time where He's literally with our forefathers, He's with us, and He's with our great, great, great grandchildren. All the generations who are celebrating on this window of time his appointed festival. I know it's deep. Hang in there. Because I'm going to prove it to you in Scripture. God, I use Scripture. That rabbi never talks about Scripture. I brought my Bible for a reason. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So, so, so kind of grasping it? Kind of grasping it? Let's go, let's go to the Scriptures and... Prove this this very point, okay? Um, Lord, and I thank you for your love, Father. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Okay. If someone can open uh, John twelve, verse one, and you can read it. Oh, no one brought their Bible. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, you're a Bible reading people. That's good. That's good. Don't get used to it. <laughs> Pretty soon, there'll be no need for I'm telling you, God promises is sure. He's raising this thing up inside of us. Okay, so can someone please read John 12, verse 1. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Stop. Did anybody catch something about days and something? Six days before Passover. Question. If you don't know God's calendar, what does six days before Passover mean to any of us? This is one of those things you skip over and says, I just want to get to the story. Six days before Passover, who cares? I don't, I don't even know what calendar that's on. Well, we're going to do the calendar right now so you can see exactly what six days before Passover is. Please keep your finger on that verse because we're going to come back to it. Okay? So I'm, get, I'm just going to draw the days of the Passover month up here. Okay? So it starts with day number one. That's pretty simple. Huh? One to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, uh, 14, 15, 16, I just got to 17, we don't need to go any further, okay, anybody know uh, what day Passover is? Does anybody know what day Passover is? <laughs> Okay, you'll find it in, in Leviticus. It says on the, on the 14th day of the month, you will celebrate the festival of Passover. Okay? All right, so Passover happens on this. By the way, I'll be cold because I don't really have time to go through all the scripture to prove the days and the times. But you can do that at home. I mean, we're in the information highway 
time. Go and Google what time of the month is Passover. You'll, you'll get it. And where do I find that in the Bible? You'll get it, okay? It's in Leviticus uh, 23. And you can also go into the Exodus where, where the Lord said, you know, on the 14th, this is going to be the Passover, okay? So, so this month over here, okay, is showing us, uh, going back to what you read. read. Read it again, please. Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Stop. Okay. When can we get to the story? Well, we got to find out what six days before Passover is, okay? Six days before Passover. Okay, this is Passover, so that's one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? This is kind of neat. So right now when it says... Six days before Passover. <clears throat> okay. To someone who understands God's calendar, that means on the ninth day of the first month of the biblical calendar. Are you with me? And if you're not, just say, what? I don't get it. And I'll explain it again. Okay. So if Passover is on the 14th, of the first month, and the scriptures say, by the way, this was written by another Jew, and a lot of Jews who wrote the book, you know what I'm saying? Oh, it is a Jewish book, okay. So anyway, <laughs> so all right, so, so, so a Jew, a Jew who reads that, understands that's the ninth day. But a Gentile who doesn't understand anything about God's appointed time, that's just a date that means absolutely nothing to them. Six days before Passover, whoop de doo well, here it is. Six days before Passover is the ninth of the month, of the biblical month. Okay? Alright? We don't have much time, so I'm going to go to the next scripture that tells you a next, a, a next appointed uh, time. Okay? So if you go down to... You know what? Read it from the beginning. It's only 12, 12 verses. Yeah, 12, 1, and read it to verse 12. Okay. <clears throat> Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover. Stop. Just kidding. No, you're not even <laughs> <laughs> came to Bethany, where Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with them. Mary then took a pound of <clears throat> very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. When Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intended to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Okay, yes. stop, stop right there. This is what happens to us when we're reading the scripture. The most significant thing under what we're explaining here was six days before, before Passover. But there's a whole bunch of really juicy story. And we forget that God gave us a time for a reason. And we just get engrossed in the story. You know, Mary comes and, and we re recognize with her. She's, she's washing his feet with, with the perfume. And, and Judas is a traitor. So we get engrossed with the story. But we miss these, that every single thing that has been placed in the book is significant. Okay? So we're going to skip to verse 12 because there's, we are familiar with the juicy parts of the story. What we're not familiar is the calendar part of the story. Fair to say? So let's jump to back to where we get to the calendar part of the story. So this happened on the ninth day. The ninth day of the first month. Okay? Um, go ahead and go to uh, uh, verse 12. On the next day, the large crowd... Stop. Now we have more information. The next day. So if he did this on the ninth, what's the next day? The tenth. Wow, this is a good class. I like <laughs> Okay. So on the 10th day, on the 10th day, are you with me? We're not messing up math here. This is simple math, right? On the 10th day, the next day, okay? Continue reading so we can know what's happening. Okay. Let's see. Okay, on the next day, the large crowd would come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees, and went out to meet him. 
and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, stop right there. More juicy stuff. We're familiar with that. The triumphant what? Entry. We're paying no attention to the calendar because we're excited that a prostitute washed his feet and he's entering and Hosanna, Hosanna. And then some Jews said, shut him up. And he said, if they shut up, then the rocks will praise me. And you read them, you're like, praise God, the rocks will praise him. And you're missing these little clues that God is giving us in his word, giving us exactly the moment in time when these events took place. Have you ever asked yourself, how is it that the children of Israel accepted Yeshua as a king on the 10th, and by the 14th, they killed him. Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever said to yourself, oh, what the hell's the matter with these people? These stiff-necked Jews. Man, if I was back then, I would have never, I would have never. Oh my God, thank God that you're not back there because you would have been the generation who would have rejected him. God is orchestrating a play. He's got a bunch of actors and he just throws you in where he needs to fill in the gaps of the story and he manifests what he wants to manifest with a generation as he wants to do it. Amen. When you realize that alone, you begin to give people a lot of breaks and say, you know what? I don't know why you don't understand God. Maybe God created not to know him so that he can show you his mercy. I don't know. I don't know why you are the way you are. Okay? So, Ninth day, prostitute washes his feet. Tenth day, he's received into the house of Israel. And we know he was crucified on the 14th, Passover. Okay? Now let's get back to God's calendar time here. Okay? If this is Passover, what day is that? 14th. I'm quick to, to help out here, you know? Okay, so this is the 14th. Can you see it? It doesn't matter. This is the 14th. Therefore, one, two, three, four days before that, on the 10th, on the 10th, on this particular year, the children of Israel with branches welcomed Yeshua into the city. Do you want to find out what's going on in God's calendar all the way back down to Egypt? Let's go and find out. Um, can you please go to Exodus 12? <laughs> Exodus 12, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the, this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. I'm freaking out! <laughs> Did you catch a date there? Yes. Yeah. We're talking about what month, which month are we in? In, 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 the, in, the, in Exodus there? This month shall be for you the first month. The first month, month of Nisan. Okay? And on what day of the month you're supposed to do something? It's verse 3. The 10th. Oh, oh, oh. So, over here in Exodus, on the 10th day of the month, the children of Israel had to do what? Uh, take a lamb. Take a lamb into what? The home, into the house. Into their home. Right. For four days. They were to take a lamb and actually treat it like a pet. 
And it was God's way of saying, I, I don't want you to grab a lamb that you don't know. I want you to take a lamb into your home so you get familiar with this lamb. So your children get familiar with this lamb. So you get attached to the lamb. When the children of Israel, according to John, received Yeshua into the house, they were doing exactly what they did in the ancient times. Because in God's window of time, God saw the children of Israel, according to the commandment, bring a lamb into the house as the Lamb of God was walking into Jerusalem, and you were saying, Behold, behold the King, the King, the King, the King, Hosanna to the King. They were receiving the Lamb into Jerusalem at the same time that the children of Israel were commanded, Bring a Lamb into your house and take good care of it. Mm. Wow. You with me so far? God, in the windows of time, was seeing the children of Israel in Egypt bringing in a little lamb at the same time that he's watching himself walking into Jerusalem and being received. Then now he began to understand, well, how could these Jews accept him four days before they killed him? I don't get it. You will get it in a few moments because you can't mess with God's plans. You know what? If the children of Israel would have understood that that was the Messiah, there would be no salvation for us today because if they didn't reject Him, right. if they would have made Him king, right. there would be no salvation for anybody. Amen. Not even the Jews. Right. Because He needed to lay down His life. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Okay. So, triumphant entry happened exactly at the same moment that the children of Israel received the Lamb into their homes in Egypt. In Egypt, okay, 10th day of the first month in Egypt, 10th day of the first month in John. Uh, go ahead and read verse uh, 6, Exodus 12, verse 6. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Stop right there, stop right there. You shall keep it until what? 14th day of the same month. Okay. Who's telling them to do this stuff? Okay, so God says, bring the thing into the house, take care of it. And on the 14th, kill. Read it again. Okay. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Okay, wait a minute. Then who, who has to kill it? Congregation of Israel. Who has to kill it? Read it again. The twilight. Okay. Okay. So, the twilight of this day, who has to kill them? Who has to kill them? The whole? The whole assembly. Right. The nation? Of Israel, we're going to just go ahead and put a little cross over here. I mean, a little uh, Star of David over here. So God is instructing Israel, bring the lamb into the house, and on the 14th, kill it. In God's window of time, exactly on the 14th, many years later, there was Yeshua, and Pilate said, I see no wrong in this man, and the community of Israel said, Crucify him. They were fulfilling God's commandment exactly as God commanded in Egypt when God said, and all of the Jews must kill this thing. He didn't say, and the Gentiles will kill it. He didn't say, and then see if someone won't like it and put it on a cross. He said, all the community of Israel must slay the lamb. What the children of Israel did 2,000 years ago without any knowledge was obey God's commandment given in the Torah, perfectly, so that we could be saved. At the very moment, do you remember, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to read anymore. We've read enough. Because I can't even flow and wait and all that. At the same very moment, at the same very moment, because you understand Passover, okay? They kill the lamb on the 14th, okay? Yeshua was killed on the 14th, okay? Once they killed the lamb, the children of Israel in Egypt, what were they supposed to do with the lamb? Spread it over the doorpost of their house. What did the children of Israel many years later on Calvary say to Pilate when he said, I see no blemish in this man? They said, take his blood 
and place it over us and over our children. In their hate, they were suckering themselves into salvation because the only way to be saved is by being sprinkled by the blood of the Lamb. They were asking the blood of the Lamb to be placed on them at the same moment that God said to take the blood and put it on the doorpost of your house so that the angel of death will pass over your house and will not come and destroy you. That's why as a descendant of the children of Israel, it was their prayer that has allowed me to be here as one of their descendants filled with the glory of God and filled with His Spirit and by the blood of the Lamb. And all this happened at the same moment in God's time as he's seeing the future, the past, and the present in one window. On the 14th, on the 10th day of the month, bring the lamb in the house, Yeshua's walking into the city, being received as king. On the 14th, kill him. Before the 14th, you need to, the lamb has to be inspected to see if there's no blemish. Mm. Pilate is inspecting this thing. He says there's no blemish in him. Oh, no. uh -huh. Pilate grabs a thing of water and washes his hands. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's washing his He has to wash his hands because the Torah says that once a priest goes and inspects the matter, he has to wash his hands. It's all connected to Torah. It had to happen this way. He had to wash his hands before the sacrifice was passed over. They said, which one will you choose? There's Barabbas. He's a sinner. And then there's this guy who didn't know any sin. Of course Barabbas has to be freed. That is the only way that he came so that Barabbas could be free. They can't pick Barabbas over him. You take him. Now there's a little dilemma. I'm going to share a little bit of thing. There, when Yeshua's on, on earth, there's a little dilemma. There is the dilemma of the priesthood because God honors the high priestly hood. And there's actually three priests on earth at this point in time. Okay? The priest who was supposed to be the anointed high priest was the son of Zacharias, which would have been Yohanan, John the Baptist. The, the Baptist. So spiritually, John the Baptist was the spiritual high priest. Caiaphas was the legal high priest. He was not a spiritual man. He was with a Sanhedrin. He was kind of part of like, he, he was kind of like a, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> I can't, can't talk. Ah, God help me. Okay. Uh, he, was he was a political high priest. He wasn't a spiritual high priest. But God honors the priesthood. Okay. And so Yeshua, first of all, uh, uh, God has to demote the first high priest, which is the spiritual high priest, because the true high priest is walking on the scene, which is Yeshua. Jesus himself, okay? The real high priest would have been John the Baptist. John the Baptist sees him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a high priest saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to even tie your sandals. I'm, you're the one. So this high priest, the spiritual high priest, was placing the spiritual mantle of high priesthood on Yeshua by saying, It isn't me. I must decrease that he may increase. So he was placing on Yeshua the spiritual priesthood. But there's another problem. There's another high priest, the legal one. God needs to, to demote because those have to go down so that his high priest himself can rise up. So John the Baptist, after John the Baptist says, that's the one, I've been preaching about this guy. Immediately he has to go into prison. Why? He needs to lose his head. Why? Because he can't have his priestly head. He's about to receive a new head, the head of Messiah. So he's losing his own. It's like he's anointing. Everything is gone because God is coming with a new thing. So he's gone. He's demoted. He's gone. There's no more spiritual high priest except for Yeshua. But there's a legal high priest, which is Caiaphas. So they bring Yeshua before Caiaphas. And Caiaphas begins to speak with him. And Caiaphas says, I adjure you by the living God. By the way, that's in Torah. In Torah it says that if a leader tells you, I adjure you by the living God, you must speak. Remember how Yeshua wasn't talking at all? He wasn't talking. He was silent, 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 silent. And all of a sudden he spoke. Everyone knows, why, why, why did he speak? He, he was silent. Why did he suddenly speak? Because according to Torah, when, when the leader of the people of Israel said, I say, adjure you in the name of the Lord, you have to speak. So he had to speak. And he said, I, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sit at the right hand of the Father, coming in glory with his angels, right? And when he said that, 
Caiaphas was so upset that he took his garments and he rent his garments open according to the Torah. When a high priest rips his garments, he demotes himself. So at that very moment, Caiaphas had to rip his garments because Yeshua had to be promoted not only to the legal high priest, but the spiritual high priest as well. At that point, they take and they take a, 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 a mantle and they put it over him to mock him. And they put a crown over his head. They had to put a crown over his head because God is doing a unique spiritual thing. He says, I am not only the high priest, priest, but I am a king as well, so they had to put a crown of thorns, they were mocking him, and they give him a staff and they were hitting him, but they had to put a crown over his head, because he is switching from, from not just high priestly hood, but kingship, and there's never, there was never such thing before, before there was kings, and there were priests, at this moment, because of the blood of the lamb, because God is uniting all things in his perfect timing, he's bringing this thing together, so he has, he's a king, but he also has a mantle, now you know, they put him up on the cross, and they took the mantle, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, the men who are mocking him, they, they said, hey, this is worth a lot, this is worth a lot, let's rip it up, let's rip it up, if they would have ripped it, he would have been demoted, at this point, he's on the cross, he can't even protect his mantle, and God used uh, greed, God used greed and greedy men to say, no, 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 let's not rip it, let's go ahead and cast lots to see if we can get it. God is so amazing that he wasn't worried about evil men holding on to the mantle that could have demoted Messiah because he knew, I will use greed, I will use gambling to do my will. That God is so amazing, he will use whatever he can, however he wants to, to bring the glory onto himself. And he's doing all of this in his perfect time as he begins to look at the festivals of the Lord, one after another, you don't miss a thing. Warrior of all warriors, man. Nothing faces this guy. Nothing. I mean, the Pharisees come to trick him. He's seeking. Nobody can mess with him. Even his death. He says, you can't take my life. I give this thing. You see, it wasn't an execution. It was a sacrifice. He gave himself for he who knew no sin became sin that we can be righteous. So he gave this up. Nobody took his life. He gave it. He had the authority to give it. He would have the authority to raise it up again. It's God's business what he's going to do, but that's his property. It says somewhere that he's the potter and we're the clay. And if that's his property, I don't know how he's going to fix the pottery. I don't know how he's going to fix anything, but that's the kingdom of heaven. The money that was brought into the temple was used to buy the potter's field and Judas didn't know it. He killed himself on the kingdom of heaven field. I'm telling you, the understanding of God's salvation, when God says, Behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. What is it about all that we don't understand? That is what's going to save them. I'm not telling them, well, the Lord, you got to be, you got to love the Lord, you got to read His word. It's not. We're not supposed to be witnessing that way. Witnessing is radiating the glory of God, not talking about God. Mm. It's radiating His presence, His love, His mercy. He fell in love with you before you even came through your mother's womb. And He set Himself apart for you. He loved you just the same when you didn't know Him. As he will love you if you lay down your life for him. 